Take Issue. And now, Michael Krasny. Good evening and welcome to Take Issue. I'm Michael Krasny. It's been two years since Californians passed Proposition 227 that called for an end to bilingual education and the beginning of English-only classes. Even after it passed, the debate lived on and has spread to other states like Arizona and Colorado who are also considering ending bilingual education. But when this year's California test results came in, it proved that the English-only classes actually seemed to help those students with limited English language skills obtain higher scores. Younger children especially seem to benefit from new programs that focused on reading and other subjects. KRON's Carl Sunken reports on one South Bay school's results. Well, first of all, we had to kind of train them to like the ball. While the Tex robot dogs were putting on a show for vacationing school kids, a group of school administrators were touring the place, holding a meeting there, and pleased with their test scores. Our students, uh, English learner students, have done well on the Stanford night. Pat Stellwagens with San Jose's Berryessa School District. What, what else can you use, Christina? Data released today shows Berryessa and many districts statewide increased their test scores for students whose English is limited. We have made sure that they have to write, listen, speak, and read English. While school may have been far from the minds of kids at the Tech today, the Berryessa school officials were strategizing for the next round of exams. We want to make sure that our teachers are getting more skilled in the classrooms. We have multiple assessments. That certainly helped the scores in Berryessa this year and other districts. For example, East Palo Alto second graders at one school showed a big score jump from last year in both reading and math, both for English-speaking students and English learners. And in San Jose's Alum Rock District, the score increases for English learners were actually higher. Berryessa principal Carol Marr credited extra teachers. And what they did was they spent an hour to hour and 15 minutes on really small group instruction on building those language skills. That costs districts extra money, but one in four California school kids have limited English ability, and two years ago the voters outlawed bilingual education. Experts say it's too early to say if that's making any difference in the test scores. Despite Proposition 227, bilingual education still exists in the San Jose Unified District thanks to a court order. And the star scores there didn't bode well for at least one school, Almaden Elementary. The second grade showed dramatic score drops in both reading and math for both English speakers and non-English speakers as well. Have English-only classes really worked or are teachers merely teaching to the test? And how are children affected in the long term by English-only classes? And do children lose part of their culture by taking English only classes. Join our discussion with your thoughts at 1 800 94 Bay TV or on the internet at baytv.com and click on the Take Issue queue. With me now to talk about this are people on either side of the issue. Ruben Rosales is chair of the legal subcommittee for the Pro Education Committee, which is for bilingual education. He's from Pittsburgh. And next to him is Silicon Valley businessman Ron Unz, author of Prop 227 and advocate of English immersion classes. Welcome to both of you. Ron Enns, let's begin with you. How do we know from these results that, number one, it isn't just teaching to the test, as some are claiming, or for that matter, the fact that you've got smaller classes, that you've got phonics teaching, that you've got more teacher training, all those factors may be really integral, more than just the fact that we're doing immersion. Absolutely. There are a lot of separate in factors involved here, but we should remember during the 227 campaign a couple of years ago, the supporters of bilingual education tended not to defend bilingual programs, which they admitted had a lot of problems. But they claimed if the initiative passed and were implemented, the result would be a disaster. There would be a plummet in student test scores for immigrant students. Instead, in the last two years, immigrant test scores in California have gone up by an average of 40%. Furthermore, the test scores have gone up the most in those districts which have most strictly followed the initiative and they've gone up the least in those districts which have tried to keep their bilingual programs. Let me follow so through on that sure. uh, point that you just make, because Ruben Rosales, you've got this sense that there's, there's a lot of crowing from, from people in Mr. Runza's camp. I mean, saying you guys were all doomsayers. You were, I don't know if you were one of them, but you know, there was a lot of talk of catastrophe, you know, the, the whole chicken little thing if, uh, if 227 passed. And you've got higher test scores. You can't argue with that. Well, no, I think that's only an indication of what has happened in certain areas. And I'd like to see a statewide assessment. And let's see at all these schools, in the district that I represent, which is Pittsburgh School, where the, schools, the scores did not go up. In fact, a crisis has hit where we had investigations from the state and federal government on the implementation of 227. And we have kids that have been retained 
parents have no access to the school system and what's going on waivers in non-existent. So you want so a systemic study, which is exactly what Delaney exactly. says. Exactly. I, I I'm not she convinced wants. that you know a school down in Oceanside is reflective of what's happening statewide. And I really would like to see an assessment because I got a clear example of the, the hometown I'm in clear violations of civil rights of these students. In the All right, you mentioned Oceanside. I want to get to what you see as violations of civil rights, but uh, I was saying to Ron Unz before we went on the air, that's the, you've got this guy Noonan down there. He's the poster boy now. Uh, I mean, because he was opposed for, what, 20 years? Longer than that? 30 years. 30 years, right. <laughs> opposed to, to uh, doing anything to dismantle bilingual education. He's become a convert. Absolutely. It, it really is a fascinating story. He was the co-founder of the California Association of Bilingual Educators. He was a bilingual education teacher, bilingual administrator. For 30 years, he supported bilingual education. He opposed Proposition 27, vehemently opposed it. But when it passed, He's the superintendent of Oceanside. He said the law is the law. The law has to be obeyed. And of all the school districts in California, both the supporters of 227 and the opponents agreed that he had the strictest and most complete interpretation of 227. Complete English-only classes, completely <coughs> eliminated all bilingual programs in Oceanside. There were a lot of protests against him, a lot of criticism. But the bottom line is at the end of less than two years, the test scores of all of his immigrant students have doubled. They have doubled indeed, Ruben Rosales. You see this as an aberration or something not to really uh, reflect the overall picture? I, I wouldn't put all our, you know, our efforts into this, these sheer numbers. I think, again, you know, statewide you'll find that things are different. And like I said, you know, you have certain, you, even here in the East Bay, you have schools that have done poorly trying to follow the, the law to the strictest rule. And the thing is, this is actually an, an in indication of bad law. You have a law that where districts were left to try and interpret it, and a lot of them were left trying to implement something they thought was right. Well, you and spoke before of civil rights uh, violations. What do you mean specifically? And, and that's where I'm getting at. That Pittsburgh decided to dismantle their bilingual program, thinking that that was what they're supposed to do legally, and they didn't replace it with any services. And to compare that to Oceanside, where they probably had a superintendent who was very supportive of services for the kid, minimal services for the students, and probably implemented some things. Pittsburgh did not do so. They dismantled it, farmed the kids out to classrooms, didn't provide them with any services. Even as early as last week, I met with a parent, a parent saying that our, my kid is being taught by another kid. A kid is teaching and interpreting for my kid. There's no program in place. But that's always been a problem with, with bilingual education, the state. You haven't had the personnel. You haven't had the faculty. You haven't had the training. Exactly. See, that's and actually, you know, if I can quote uh, former assemblyman Bob Campbell, who met with me in a youth group that I, that I run, uh, you know, he did a focus group throughout the state, and what he found is that bilingual programs were effective and worked when they had support. They had administrative support. They had financial support. The ones that didn't work were the ones that did not have that support. Well, what are you going to do, Ron Unz, about these kids who are left behind? Because you do have kids who are being left behind, according to Mr. Rosales, and probably that's indeed the case. That's perfectly possible. Now, the truth is California is a very large state, and I don't know the details of this particular Pittsburgh school district, and it could very well be they're doing a poor job of implementing the initiative. In fact, the initiative specifically requires that children who don't know English be placed in sheltered English immersion classes to teach them English as quickly as possible. If they're not this getting... This is the waivers... Uh, the no, no, just the regular program. Just the regular program. In other words, the regular program is sheltered English immersion. If the st immigrant students in Pittsburgh are not receiving such sheltered English immersion, then that's a violation of the law, and Pittsburgh you know, should be held accountable. What I think, though, probably both of us should be able to agree on is that Ken Noonan's district down in Oceanside has done a fantastic job. They've doubled their test scores. The immigrant students down there two years ago were far below average for the state for immigrant students. Now they're far above average. And I think other districts up and down the state should be able to learn from Oceanside, learn from the combination of English immersion classes, administrative support, and the services that you're talking about. We've got to go to a break, but full immersion right now in California is only, what, 5%, is that correct? 5%? For As far as full immersion, according to the letter of the law of what we mean by immersion now? Yeah? Oh, I think it's maybe more like 20%. Isn't that words, high? A lot of school districts have been dragging their heels in following the initiative and keeping their bilingual programs, keeping halfway disorganized programs. The truth is a lot of districts are disorganized, and no matter what the law is, they'll many times do a relatively poor job of implementing it. But those districts which have kept their bilingual programs the most have done the worst. All right, I'll ask the question pattern. of our viewers. Do you think that this program is indeed a success judging by the test scores, or should we just judge by the test scores at this point? Is it too premature and early to make that kind of a conclusion decision about bilingual education, that indeed it's supposedly, well, bringing the test scores up because it's no longer a part of the curriculum. Uh, I mean, it's a part of the curriculum in some cases, but not across the board. Let's hear from you. one 800 bay tv We invite your calls, and we'll continue after these brief messages ahead.